Our second scripture reading this morning is one verse. I said at Journey this morning, I don't know that I've ever preached on one verse. So we'll see how it goes. You can let me know. John 15, 9 says this. Jesus said, As my Abba has loved me, so have I loved you. Live on in my love. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Praise Amen. Last week, Pastor Heather asked the deep and profound and lifelong question, who are you? Who are you? How do you define yourself? What is the essential identity of who you are? She told some beautiful and hilarious stories of her first grade self answering that question and invited us to ponder what it means that Jesus says we are salt and light as a part of our identity. How would you answer that question even for yourself today? Who are you? What are those natural responses that just seem to naturally flow out of your mouth as you think about this question? Who are you? The late author Brennan Manning said this, define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. Define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. All other identity is an illusion. There is, I think, in all of us a fundamental and deep reality that longs and desires and needs to be know, needs to know that we are loved. That fundamental sense of self-identity can pivot and shift depending on how much or how little we feel lo loved in a given day, in a season, or the history of our lives. How safe and secure and reliable we sense the universe is and our place in it. The deeper and stronger and more stable the love we receive from God and others and our own selves is the, the, the deeper, the stronger, and the more stable our own identity becomes and the more confident we move in the world. Every other identity is an illusion. It fades. It dissipates. It's unstable. It's unreliable. It changes. Now that does not mean that other identities and how we identify ourselves are not good and meaningful and purposeful. It just means that they're more fluid in nature. They change. They're variable. Even Jesus, I think, needed to know that he was loved. Depending on how you grew up, I think we have a tendency to either emphasize the humanity of Jesus in our upbringing or emphasize the divinity of Jesus. And I grew up in a tr tradition that typically emphasized the divinity of Jesus. But he was also fully human, so we say. Remember Jesus' baptism? He heard that voice of God saying loud and clear to him as he came up out of the water. At least that's how I imagine it. Maybe he got sprinkled with water. I don't know. But he heard that voice. You remember the voice? This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. This is the voice of God to and for Jesus in that moment, needing to be reminded, needing to hear that he is the beloved of God. This is the voice that speaks to us because when we are baptized into Christ, that voice is ours as well. We can hold it, dwell in it, it becomes that foundational and bedrock identity that Brennan Manning speaks of. We are ones who are beloved by God. As my Abba has loved me, so have I 
loved you. Live on in my love. Remain in my love. Abide in my love. In our baptism, we're united with Jesus the Christ, and God's voice and words to Jesus are also ours. This is the voice we need, resounding in our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and souls, because it is the truest and deepest part of who we are. These words communicate the depths of God's feelings and thoughts about us and toward us. And we, like Jesus, as we go about our lives, we will be tempted to root our identity in other kinds of things. Again, not bad in and of themselves, but they're an illusion. They're fading. They're temporary. In most of the gospel stories, you remember what happens right after Jesus' baptism? Anybody? Come on, people. (laughs) The temptation. He's led into the desert, right? Right after Jesus is baptized, he's tempted. Three temptations. And I think these are fundamental temptations of identity. And I'm borrowing from the great author Henry Nouwen here in my thoughts on this. He's tempted by the one in the scriptures called Satan. But that word Satan means the accuser. The accuser. You're not all that. You are not who you say you are. This finger-wagging kind of reality, whether it's an internal reality or an external reality, he was like us, tempted to believe other voices, enticing him to do something to prove his identity as the beloved instead of freely resting, abiding, and remaining in that identity. The first temptation, I am what I do. The temptation to perform. The accuser says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, you tell these stones to become bread. If you are who you say you are, if you are who that voice from heaven says you are, the beloved son of God, then prove it. Do something amazing and spectacular. Show me what you can accomplish and achieve. Anybody identify with that? I know I do. Jesus' response, people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what word had he just heard from the mouth of God? You are loved. Jesus lives and breathes and finds nourishment upon the word of God that was just spoken to him. God loves him. God is pleased with him. And that is his source of nourishment And it's not just a coincidence that these words were spoken to Jesus in all of the gospel recordings of them before he had done one amazing thing. God is speaking to his essence, the core of who he is. He does not live and find sustenance in the actions and achievements and accomplishments of his life and work or the evaluation of others of his performance. He is sustained by the voice of God that calls him beloved. That is enough and it feeds Jesus. Second temptation. I am what others think of me. The temptation of popularity. If you are the Son of God, then throw yourself down from here and command the angels to catch you. I mean, can you imagine the stories and the amount of followers that Jesus could have had on his Instagram account? If he had pulled off a stunt like that? But Jesus securely rooted in his belovedness, did not need his identity to be validated by how many followers he had or his friends or the approval of others. Jesus' sense of self did not soar upon the praises or likes of others or fail upon the criticisms of others. Jesus' response, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus did not need to test the love and acceptance of God. Jesus' identity was and is secure and rooted in the love of God. He does not need to test or demonstrate God's approval of him by showing off, gathering a crowd, or seeking the approval of others. The approval of God and God alone was and is enough for Jesus. 
Anybody identify with that? I know I do. The third temptation, I am what I can control. The temptation of power. The devil took Jesus to the very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, I'll give you all this if you just bow down and worship me. I think this was Jesus' greatest temptation. In the end, the world is and will be his anyway. One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is indeed Lord. The temptation in this moment, if I could just shortcut the ridicule, being homeless and wandering around, being mocked, being laughed at, being misunderstood. Oh, my mother Mary, her heart is broken. She doesn't understand me. And these 12 idiots, <laughs> if I just didn't have to have them following me around for the next three years, in the garden, the betrayal, the cross, if I could just simply be given the power and authority that is rightfully mine right now, the result would be the same. Power and control, authority, are alluring temptations because intimate, relational, long-suffering love is deeply challenging and painful. If anyone's been in a, a deep and meaningful relationship, you know what I'm talking about. Henry Nowen puts it this way, power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. Jesus is perhaps so tempted in this moment to take the easy road and control and power apart from love that he says, away from me, Satan. You don't get to accuse me anymore, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve God alone. Throughout the next three years of Jesus' life, Jesus shows us the human life lived in response to the voice of God that says to each and every one of us, you are loved. He demonstrates a healthy sense of self, knowing exactly who he is and therefore exactly what he's called to do. His yes is spot on. His no is spot on. He greets people. He passes by people. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do. And I believe one of the reasons that Jesus was baptized, baptized was that as a human being, he needed to hear the voice of God reminding him of his deep acceptance and belovedness. According to the author of Hebrews, he is like us, tested and tempted in every way. Just like you and me, he was tempted to root his identity in his performance, his popularity, and his power in other people's opinions, in his actions, in his perceived successes or failures. So how do we learn to remain and abide and make our home in God's love for us just like Jesus? I'm glad you asked. It's a mystery. It's a mystery about how to do it. And yet I believe there's a path. It's not about reading a book about it. It's not about even this sermon giving you more information about it. If the recovery movie movement has taught us one thing, we cannot think our way into a new way of living. We must live our way into a new way of thinking. The answer is simple but difficult, and it will not surprise some of you, and it will annoy others of you. The answer is, we must pray. How many of you are annoyed right now? But perhaps it's not the kind of prayer that you typically think of. As I look over the life of Jesus, I see this pattern in his prayer life. And it goes something like this. Jesus dismissed the crowds he withdrew to deserted places, and he prayed. He tells people to go away, where no one, and he goes to where no one else is, where there's little or no noise or distraction, no cell phone, no people, no activity, 
no temptations, nothing to do other than to simply rest and to hear and be reminded of the voice of his Abba and Amma saying, I love you. You are my beloved child. I am well pleased with you. And he simply remained and rested and abided in these spaces on a regular basis. Jesus cultivated, I think, in himself and modeled for the rest of us what Howard Thurman calls the discipline of listening to the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if we do not get in touch with the sound of the genuine within ourselves, someone else will tell us. Someone, Howard Thurman says, it will be like a puppeteer pulling strings on your life will be in these illusionary senses of identity being pulled in this direction, in that direction, in another direction until we land in the sound of the genuine, the sound of the divine, the sound of God saying into us, you are loved. And so we simply sit, gazing upon God and God gazing upon us. And by God's grace, the one who is love slowly and gently changes us and transforms us and metamorphosizes us into the people who we were created to be. People filled with love for our own selves. We often forget that there's a third commandment in the greatest commandments. First being, right, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Second, Love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe Jesus wasn't very good at math. There's actually three commandments in there. That was a joke. <laughs> Love yourself. I think Jesus was probably pretty good at math. Love yourself. Imagine for yourself in a moment on a walk in the woods in the corner of a house in a comfortable chair at Tizay on a Wednesday night, sitting in quiet. And think of this term gaze. What is it like for God to look at you and for you to look at God? Imagine a human in your life, a partner, a family member, a friend, and you know when you have that comfort with that person that that silent gaze is not uncomfortable anymore. You know that words don't need to be spoken. I believe this is what Jesus did on a regular basis. Julian of Norwich says that when we engage God in this way, our souls are made like the one who we contemplate. Our souls are made like the one who we contemplate. And if God is love and God is looking upon us and we are looking upon God, what is in that exchange but love? And we become love for ourselves over time. And Richard Rohr fills this out with a little bit more detail. He says, we simply keep returning to the divine gaze and you become its reflection, steadfastly refusing to abandon this presence, this true self, this place that already knows you are the beloved and you are at one with God. And gradually you learn how to abide in this spacious place more and more and how to draw strength and dignity and solace from this stable source within yourself. And when you live from this place of conscious unity in the love of God, you are indestructible. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus said, as my Abba has loved you, so have I loved you. Live in my love. This is the practice of abiding in the love of God. This is the discipline of remaining in the love of God. This is the habit of resisting temptations of other identities and living in and on God's surpassing and immeasurable love for us. This is the way of loving God, loving ourselves, loving our neighbors, 
and even our enemies. So as I said a moment ago, you cannot think your way into this reality. So I want to close today with a moment of silence. Pastor Heather is going to lead us out of that silence in a, when she feels it's ready. Don't worry, the director or the, uh, the person of, responsible for spiritual life will not lead you in the silence because I would leave us here for 20 minutes. <laughs> but I'm going to read you a short poem and a prayer. And I invite, yourself, invite you to just close your eyes for a moment if you feel comfortable with that. And I want you to imagine God. Imagine God however naturally comes to you, a light, a motherly figure, a tree, whatever brings you peace. Perhaps it's the face of Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Just imagine God. As best you can in this quiet moment, however this strikes you, gaze upon God. Hear these words, and we'll spend a minute or so in quiet. Be silent. Be still. Alone. Empty. Before your God. Say nothing. Ask nothing. Be silent. Be still. Let your God love you. Let your God look upon you. That is all. God knows. God understands. God loves you with an enormous love and only wants to look upon you with that love. Quiet, still, be. Let your God love you.